Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. It started out as a pretty straightforward, simple, well-defined project, the way student projects are supposed to begin. You know, it was going to be taking Eli's interest in archaeology and uh, uh, human anatomy and try and determine tribal affiliation on these remains. Uh, but then it blossomed from there and became rather complicated. I had a student, Eli Mrak, who's pretty ambitious and talented and likes to work. And uh, he said that coming out of a background of biology and human anatomy, he said he would like to try a forensics uh, internship with the Fremont County Coroner's Office. So I contacted Ed McCausland, uh, the, the Fremont County Coroner at that time. We went down and visited with Ed and he had several options and the one uh, that, that we ultimately decided to do was this, this tribal identification project on this, this human remains that were found back in the 1960s up by Horse Creek by Dubois. We didn't have any kind of historical records from her discovery or any of the initial coroner's reports, so we were just kind of had a blank slate to try and fill. And when she was discovered, she was discovered with the mummified feet and the preserved moccasins. And so we figured that that would be our best line of evidence for helping determine where she might have come from or what tribe she might have belonged to based on the, the patterning, the artistic patterning on the moccasins and then the design of the moccasins themselves. We coordinated with Jim Stewart, a local art historian, and he's done a lot of different studies into moccasins. So we contacted him and had him look at the, the styling and kind of compare them to just historical records and more modern replicas that he had. See right here, see this serrated look? That's caused by when they sewed it together, they're doing the same sort of sewing that they're doing right along here. And as this thread on this deteriorated and broke, it also, the leather had stiffened up, and what that did then is it leaves this sort of serrated look that we're getting right along here, is how they tighten up the moccasin around their foot, right? We can see the thread, by the way, right here very easily. We can tell this is cotton, it's not sinew. Okay, that helps date it. If it had been pre-reservation, we'd expect this to be sinew. What I did is, is I did sort of a sketch off the photographs. Comes over the flap cuts here, and it goes on up here, and it does like this. This blue starts right up at the edge. So we're going to come down, take a look. It comes down here, and it pretty much comes down and across. And we see that trapezoidal image. This is blue, just to make it easy to understand what we're doing. And I'm going to have you put this straight up because I'm trying to get a measurement from about where your thumb is right here down this way. And so what we have is 10.2 centimeters long, 1.7 wide. I see no paint down in here, but we pick up the paint again after the flap over here. So that's where that flap hit. So let's put the flap back. So if a person wearing these had these wrapped, you would see the red and the blue going clear around. What you wouldn't see is just this area. So it would do exactly that. So when I look at the rest of it, I'm seeing the rest of this flap in here being red. Clear over to the edge. See the edge? Yeah. Okay. Clear over here. And it goes up this edge right here. It sort of takes doing this sort of exercise to get a better idea what the design does. This is an assumption that when we had this moccasin from the front, we'd have had the opposite one doing just the opposite of this. So it looked like the woman was wearing red moccasins with these two blue stripes coming down, maybe doing a V if she had her feet together. We can actually put these two moccasin heels right up against each other and show that some of the stitching for how some things are put together still fit in the same age group as possibly this one in my hand. 
And this is possibly a crow moccasin, by the way, which would have had a lot of the same habits if this was a crow moccasin or if this is a Shoshonean moccasin, which I think we're guessing is a Shoshonean. We know some of it we can measure, some of it we can say that's definitive. Some of it we didn't have to because it's not nice and clean like this where we can do the whole design. We have to speculate on things and, uh, because what we're dealing with is the remains that we, we're not going to play around with. Just simple as that. Would Some the, questions. Would the red paint have been like an ochre type? Paint I, it could have been. Uh, I would, I would think probably that would have been the easiest move for for a tribal person to use. Uh, the blue probably though is is possibly a commercial bought at J K Moore store or some other equivalent. If I just seen the moccasin and nothing else, I wouldn't guess she was in her 20s. I would guess that she's a little younger than that. So she'd have put it on, she'd have wrapped this piece around the front, and then she'd have tied it to hold it on. And like I said, the chances are that she, she died with this pair on. That's why they're on her. He was able to help us determine that this, this style was most likely a Shoshone style or, or Crow, which are both fairly common for this area. And then we had to inventory everything, see what was there, and start making judgments right away about the condition of the bone, any possible pathologies or signs of trauma, you know, injuries, breaks, or cancers, or anything like that. And um, right away, the first thing we realized when we pulled the skull out was that she had the hypoplasia marks on, on some of her teeth. We weren't really sure what that meant, so we wanted Dr. Sheridan to look at them and give us a more of a professional analysis on, on her teeth. Uh, if you look closely, you'll notice that she's got some pitting in the uh, enamel, just real slightly, on, the, on her canines, and maybe a little bit on her left premolars here. And it, this is something that um, these teeth all come in around the age of 11 to 12 years old. So any disruption in the enamel formation on these guys typically would happen around the age when the, when the person was three or four years old. So if she had a viral infection, fever, malnourished at that time even, uh, that would reflect in the teeth at this age, but it would be around three or four years old. Looks like a fairly rough diet. Um, a lot of... Uh, Abrasives. You can tell that obviously just by the wear on the teeth. I'm gonna take a couple here. Yep. Okay. Based on the tooth eruption, he was able to give us a time of age when she died. He determined her to be in her early 20s. We had a rough idea just based off of the fusion of the epiphyses on her long bones and then the sutures on her skull. But having his analysis, I think, really narrowed it down. We can see that her uh, wisdom teeth had come in. Uh, they had erupted, it looks like, I don't know, fully or not, at least 18 years old. Uh, the wear in here is not horribly excessive with the diet. I think that would be consistent around that time. But, uh, you know, she's missing a number of teeth in here that she lost post-mortem. Uh, you can tell because the, the bones all socketed here. You, you, you can see where the periodontium was, which is um, the space between the roots and the bone. And from there, we had to start considering when she died, age at time of death, and, and make a more close uh, examination to try and figure out if, she had, if she'd had children or, or how old she was when she died and things like that and, and get to know her a little more personally. The, the story has kind of fallen out of the, the local folklore up around Dubois. There are a tiny handful of people that seem to know about it. As far as we were able to ascertain, there were some fellows hunting or fishing or rock hunting or what, we don't know, maybe working on an oil well and found the remains. A lot of people from town came out to look at the skeleton and apparently some things disappeared then. And then a sheriff's deputy was called and, and got up there with maybe by the next day. And again, this is very tenuous. No one really remembers clearly what happened that we were able to find anyway. And uh, then the the deputy took the remains, collected everything that was there, and took them to the coroner's office sometime apparently in the mid to late 1960s. And then everything stayed there until uh, about 1980s. And uh, then the coroner's office did a, an analysis or an inventory of all their remains for the Wyoming Crime Lab. 
And that's when Dr. George Gill at the University of Wyoming did some detailed metric analysis. And then more analysis of the bones was made uh, about that time by Rick Weatherman, who's also on the faculty at UW, and Doug Owsley is a Wyoming native who's now at the Smithsonian. He's one of the chief human osteologists there. And we didn't know all that at the time, but we were able to track down some of those records. And that's how we found out the list of the, the grave goods, the burial goods that, that she was wrapped in when she was laid to rest. Initially with her when she was buried were a bracelet made of brass firing caps, a U.S. Army helmet cord, a plaid Scottish blanket, and then like a, a canvas blanket. The golden officer's helmet cord that was the best thing that we had to date. You know, it couldn't have been before 1872. And so George's description of those grave goods was really useful to us in terms of dating the burial, because except for a few tiny fragments of the blankets, all of the burial goods have disappeared over the years. We don't know when or where. The lines on her teeth that we had seen were signs of uh, malnourishment early on in, in her life. And so, we started to piece together some ethnographic history and reading through some different articles that talked about the conditions on the reservation at the time this girl lived. And we started to realize that she was part of this government starvation. And so the focus really at that point had switched from just determining what tribe she belonged to into trying to determine how this girl might have lived and died and possibly died at the hands of the reservation agents. It became an issue of justice as well, based on historical information that we had about what was going on on the reservation at that time. And um, I got kind of personally wrapped up in it, as most people did, uh, because of my own biography. When, when I came down here from South Pass, down here to the to Lander Valley, the Wind River Valley, uh, to become the director at the museum in Lander, I talked to people, you know, what were things like, of course, and looked in the historic records and, and got my feet on the ground. And there were a couple of women from Lander that I visited with, and the conversation got around to the American Indian Movement AIM and everything, and, and they told me, well, we never had problems like that here. And this is a quote, our Indians are happy Indians. And that was kind of a stunning revelation. And especially then as I continued to do more historical research and I, I met a fellow named Hank Stam who did his doctoral dissertation on early reservation history and the Shoshone, Eastern Shoshones and then published a book, People of the Wind River. And the stories that he includes in there and the other records that we had in the Pioneer Museum talked about starvation and, and, and sorrow and hardship and all kinds of things that didn't sound very happy. In fact, he was able to document 30% mortality rate from starvation on parts of the reservation during the 1880s and 1890s. 1868, they signed the treaty to form the Wind River Reservation. After that time, just the conditions on the reservation really plummeted for the Indians. As part of the regulations on the treaty, the Indians were not allowed to leave the reservation. And beyond that, they they were not allowed to hunt either. They were Any hunting big game was illegal to, to only the Indians. But since they weren't allowed their farming equipment and there were not ample supplies for food on the reservation, so many of these people had to venture out. I mean, they were really fighting for their lives, so they were gonna do anything even if it meant you know, getting in trouble leaving the reservation. And so we think that she was up more, most likely with her family trying to get some food. She was hungry. We suspect she either died literally of starvation or her system was weakened and died of starvation-related diseases. While well, the family had snuck off the reservation, probably from the Crowheart Burris area, and worked their way up the river and were in between some of those homesteads along Horse Creek in the late 1880s, early 1890s, looking for something to eat, a bunny or a gopher or choke cherries or grass seeds or something and she finally succumbed to malnutrition and there she remained in between homesteads of well-fed homesteaders till the remains were discovered in the 1960s. It was intriguing to me the history that goes behind all of this. For example, this ranch where we're at today was homesteaded by the Coutant family and they wrote this book 
the history of Wyoming, which they published in 1899, and there's hardly a mention of the reservation or Indian-white relations in there, except in terms of the Indians were savages and hostile and killing all the poor, helpless white pioneers. And that's about the extent of it. And the same thing with, with Cap Nickerson's you know, early history of Fremont County and the Wind River Basin, uh, which was first researched and written during the 1860s and 70s when it was news, before it was history. And I, these paint a very white picture of, of local history. The Coutants that wrote this book also published the Lander newspaper during the 1890s. And there's no mention in the book or in the newspapers that I've ever found of one in three people here, part of this community, dying of starvation. Stam's book focused more on, on native history. So what we're looking at here is, is at least one in three died from starvation and the, the, the enrolled numbers of Shoshones and Arapahos during that period, late 1880s and 1890s, just plummeted. We have photos of Indian women, probably Shoshone women, on their hands and knees on the sidewalks in Lander gathering weeds, you know, edible plant foods to take home to eat because the rations were cut down once the buffalo were all killed and there was no hunting anymore. The government rations were cut down over a period of time to 227 calories per person per day. And, you know, one of the Indian agents out there at the fort when the, the tribe asked permission to go hunting said, would not give them permission to leave the reservation, said, no, you will stay here and die and so will your children. And, and uh, Stam found some remarkable doc documents there. Some people would spin that and say that it was well-intentioned, and some of the agents wrote about this and said, we're trying to force them to farm. And the, basically the, the uh, unwritten assumption is the ones who won't start farming will die and get out of the way. Uh, but then the agents did not release the farming equipment that was sent out here by Congress. And so people who wanted to farm starved because they didn't have plows or, or wagons or anything like that. And so it was really a tragic time. And so when we opened up that bone box and saw right away those hypoplasias on, on the teeth, all of a sudden we had solid evidence of genocide on the Wind River Reservation, you know, of government conscious government efforts over a period of several administrations to uh, get rid of the native population here. We took it to Sage West Hospital in Lander and had the radiology department up there do a, a CAT scan for us. And the reason we were doing that is because we needed to get that high resolution image so we could send it to the University of Wyoming and have them print a 3D replica of the skull. Correct. And that was going to be the basis for Sharon to build the face off of. And we wanted to do everything we could to and bring her back to life and be able to tell her story. And we felt like one of the best things we could do for that would to be get the facial reconstruction done. Um, and, and Todd had contacted Sharon Long, who was a, a retired Smithsonian sculptress and who'd done facial reconstructions with the support of the Wyoming Shippo office where she works. Everybody decided that it would be all right for us to bring her out of retirement and have her help us one more time on this project. Okay, when I start out, first thing is I do is I get myself acclimated with the skull and I just look at it. I look at the pictures and I think and I take note and then what you have to do is take four measurements. So I cut all these little erasers. There's 21 different ones. So I put them on as guides. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to put clay strips from this point to that point to that point to this point down. I put the strips on first and then I fill it in. People want to know, well, how do you think you get them so alive? I have kind of a guardian angel, you know, and I ask for guidance and I get guidance. I had never done a face before. I just said, this is what you want me to do, then please show me the way. And I do that every time. And I wait for a kind of a chill, and then I know I'm being guided, and I carry on. You know, you can always feel whether there's a lump. So it's always 
touching, touching, touching. With her experience, she was able to, to just look at the face and you know be able to tell certain ways that this girl would have looked like while she was living. I'm just getting blocked in so I can refine it, you know, as I go along. But sometimes I get it right the first time, and sometimes I have to just keep working it and working it until it feels right. If you could see her change, you know, she would do the nose and it wouldn't be quite right and so she'd go back and fix it and she'd do the lips and they wouldn't look quite right and each time she'd be checking depths and, and just as the face came together she was just very you know, meticulous about it, making sure that every little bit of it was perfect. This is a science and artistic because you got to know anatomy and you got to know something about art somehow. Well, you're probably not going to pull this off. And as the process kind of went along, I think Sharon was able to connect with Horse Creek Girl a little bit and, and find some more happy points in her life and was able to create the face more of not so much as somebody who had just starved to death, but, then, but as somebody who had you know, lived and wasn't completely emaciated. Seems like this little girl couldn't have weighed more than 90 pounds. I mean, looking at her face, she, you know, I mean, she was really gaunt when she died. She still laughed and played and had friends. Doing these facial reconstruction projects is, is exhausting. It takes a lot of concentration, a lot of energy, a lot of effort, and, and some research. But we're very grateful to her because that added a really important aspect to this project. Instead of just having bones and stories and photographs of other people, suddenly now we can see this girl's face, which no one has seen since the day she died. And I think that helps to restore her humanity. Part of what makes archaeology a legitimate discipline is that we tell people what we found either in National Geographic articles or television documentaries or museum exhibits or classroom lectures, whatever. We share the information that we get. People want to know this stuff. As part of Professor Gunther's program, he pushes his students to present papers at the Wyoming State Archaeological Conference. And, and so from writing the initial report for Ed, we had done all this other work with Sharon and Dr. Sheridan and the radiology department and so there was kind of a whole new aspect of the project that needed to be added to the paper and it was just an honor to be a part of it. One of the things I didn't really realize how powerful of a project this was until after giving that paper and seeing people's response to it. I was getting texts from faculty at other institutions and professionals around the region while he was speaking that were blown away just saying, this is real anthropology, it's holistic, it's universal, he's bringing in information from all kinds of different diverse disciplines from, I mean, from art to zoology and the analysis of the bones and, and the facial project and everything else and the ethno history and everything in between. And then his skill at relating that story to a huge audience of strangers who are professionals. And that was a pretty intimidating situation for him. Although this project was centered on a devastating account, there are many aspects of Horse Creek Girl and her life that brought a great number of people together to help me tell her story. Once different the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act was a result of, of lobbying by a lot of tribes from all around the country back in the, the 70s and 80s. And then uh, by the early 90s, all museums, all archaeological repositories were supposed to have inventoried all the human remains, all the burial goods, ceremonial objects, and, and inform the relevant tribes what was in those collections so that the tribes could reclaim things if they wanted them, you know, human remains or grave goods or, or things like that, and, and then bring them home for reburial. What we're required to do as a part of Eli's internship was report to the coroner's office that everything that we could find uh, indicates both the, the cranial facial metrics, the measurements on her bones, uh, she looked Shoshone, and she was buried in a place where we would expect to find Shoshones, not Arapahoes. Um, 
and the grave goods were pretty typical of a Shoshone burial. Yeah. And, and then the style of the burial, crevice burial, suggests Shoshone. They were a tribe that practiced that as a way of laying their loved ones to rest. So we informed the coroner's office that we think she was Eastern Shoshone. Based off of all of our findings, she most likely lived sometime between 1880 and 1910. She was around 20, early 20s when she died. We believe that she was a member of the Shoshone tribe, just based on her cranial facial indices and grave goods and just the place and time that she was uh, buried and discovered. More than likely, this girl was starved to death by the government regulations. What was the face that, that her parents or someone who loved her had to tenderly cover and, and then put away forever? She becomes human instead of just you know, a historical tale or an archaeological tale. That face restores her humanity. The, you know, the face of a 20-year-old who uh, died as a result of, who we believe died as a result of government policies on the Wind River Indian Reservation. And just being able to tell her story and kind of, you know, let the public know what, what was happening, I think in, in doing that we did restore a bit of her humanity.